Dear God, thank you for your love for us, and we certainly uh, thank you for our time together to gather in your name. And as we get into a passage this morning, Lord, that um, at first glance seems to have no relevance for us, I pray that we would dig deeper together and see that there are principles here that still matter for us today. And so thank you for uh, just for each person here and for your word, and, and certainly we want to learn more about this um, this curious subject here this morning. And so thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here, that you inspired even this section of Corinthians and, and that it matters enough that you preserved it for us. And so thank you, uh, thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So, <clears throat> again, we're doing books of the Bible verse by verse. And who here has read 1 Corinthians chapter 11? So if you've read the Bible at any length, you've come across this passage about head coverings, which is interesting. And uh, we're going to get into that today. Um, this is going to sound really far removed from our culture. I don't see a single woman here wearing a head covering, okay? And that's okay. We're going to get into that. Um, it's far removed from us, uh, but I, I don't think it's irrelevant, uh, but I do think it is very confusing. Let me say this as well. This passage at first glance comes off incredibly sexist and misogynistic, like really sexist, really misogynistic. Our culture would scoff at this passage, reading it. And I think even a Christian woman who loves the Lord might look at this and be uncomfortable. So I just wanted to throw that out there, break the ice, and recognize that uh, this isn't uh, an easy passage at all. And so what do we do with this section, which we're going to read here in a minute? <clears throat> Let me say right up front, if you are a person who believes that women should wear head coverings in the church, I respect that. And actually, frankly, um, I think that's a fair interpretation of the text. Maybe you're surprised to, to hear me say that. Um, but, but a plain reading of this section really seems to teach that a woman should cover their head in submission to the men who are in authority over them. That's what it seems to be saying. Now, we'll get into what this all means for us eventually. I want you to keep in mind that women covering their heads, there's a lot, there's a lot of whispering here this morning. I suspect there'll be lots, and that's okay. Okay, all right. So, head coverings in Paul's time, were they normal or not normal? Totally normal. Okay, you go to Eastern cultures today, totally normal, women covering their heads. Okay. It's really only in European, North American cultures in recent centuries that women um, don't cover their heads. So we're actually the, the abnormal ones historically, culturally, compared to most of the world. Now, in Paul's time, if you were a Jew, <clears throat> it was expected of you— and can someone close the door for me there, Mary? Let's just close that for sound. It was expected of the Jews to cover their heads. And in the Roman Empire, it was— um, culturally appropriate. So a, Ro a Roman Gentile may be not necessarily required, but it was sort of considered, considered modest. And, and so to not cover your head as a woman in that day was considered immodest. We'll talk about modesty today uh, quite a bit. So it was considered immodest. And so, for example, the ones in that culture who would not cover their heads and, sh and women who would shave their heads, they were prostitutes and lesbians. Okay? And so let's consider that cultural background as we get into this, because again, if that's how you looked in that culture, how does that translate into coming into that, like into the church looking that way? So just think of that as we get into this, okay? And so again, how women in North America dress in 2024 is very different. Um, from most of human history and even from a large part of the world. And whether that's good or bad, I will leave up to you to decide. Do you think more modesty or less modesty is a good thing? Okay. Here's the angle I'm going to take in this passage, and what you do with it is up to you to decide. But I think, so what we tend to do in this passage is, is we debate head coverings. I think Paul is addressing a problem that is being that is coming out as the head coverings issue, but there's actually a deeper issue here, and it's this. It was these uh, Corinthians, and it seems like it was the women, 
It was a lack of submission to authority, in particular their husband's authority, a lack of modesty, and women not honoring their husbands. So are those things that we could apply in different ways today? Does that matter today? I think so. Okay? And so, again, this came out for them as them not covering their heads during worship. For us, that might come out differently, but it still is possible for women to not uh, honor their husbands. So again, I think personally, my, so just up front, my view is that this is cultural. It doesn't apply today. So just so you know, that's, that's my view, but if you believe that, if you think I'm wrong, I understand why you think that. I think we miss the forest for the trees, so to speak, if we get stuck in this debate about head coverings. And churches have been fighting about this for a long time. Should women cover their heads? Should men be allowed to have long hair? Should men be required to wear suits? How about 40 years ago in this church? 30 years ago, 20 years ago, I would have to be wearing a suit being up here, right? That's changed. Maybe you still think I should be wearing a suit. How long should the woman's skirt be? Not above the knee, right? Amen, right? I mean, that's the way things were, I guess, at the time. But I think when we get into these arguments, we miss the root issue, actually, of what's going on in this church. And the root of this whole thing is rebellion against God-given authority in the home and in the church. And so these women who weren't covering their heads uh, were revealing by their actions that they did not respect their husbands and that they did not care about modesty. So if something in that culture is immodest and you say, I don't care about that, I'm going to do what I want, then you're being immodest and that is causing a distraction in the church and it's being causing your brother to stumble and so forth, bringing shame to your husband, right? And so whatever you think about this issue of of head coverings, maybe you agree with me that it's only cultural, maybe you disagree with me, Um, I think these issues I have on the screen of modesty, submission, and honoring those in authority um, are totally relevant in our day and age, Um, especially considering how much people hate authority in our day and age. Okay, so let's jump in here, beginning in verse 1. I wonder how many churches are preaching on head coverings this week in North America. Maybe we're the only one. I don't know. <clears throat> imitate me, he says, just as I also imitate Christ. Now, I praise you, brethren. There's a little bit of sarcasm here, but maybe not. I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. But I want you to know <clears throat> that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay, <clears throat> so here's a, maybe a scary thing to say in our culture. The Bible teaches that men and women are different. Who here disagrees with that statement, men and women are different? Our culture doesn't believe that, by the way. <laughs> they believe we're totally the same now, right? And, so, and though men and women are equal in value, they have different roles at home and in the church. Real controversial stuff here, right? Like we have some pregnant women in the room. Men can't get pregnant, right? You know our culture says men can get pregnant now? So just so you know, strange stuff, right? Is it interesting here as well? It says that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God the Father. What does it mean to be the head of something? One author described it in this way. In its full sense, head has the idea of headship and authority. It means to have the appropriate responsibility to lead and the matching accountability. It is right and appropriate to submit to someone who is our head. Very important to note that the headship uh, men have over women is in the home and in the church. And so it isn't that every woman in this room is under the authority of every man in the room. Very important to understand that. And so when a woman marries a man, she's putting herself under his headship. When you're in a church, you're putting yourself under the headship of the pastor and elders, so to speak. Okay? So not every woman here is under every other man. So it's not that just men in society are over women in every single way. It's specifically in the home and the church. Okay, so maybe we can breathe a sigh of relief for that. Because again, that's, this can be misused to, to say something that it doesn't actually say. Um, Now, again, hearing this talk of being under a man, um, 
especially maybe for you ladies, uh, it maybe makes you cringe a little bit. And I think maybe that's because we've seen so many in authority abuse their power. And maybe uh, it's because our culture has convinced us that to be under authority makes us inferior to the one we are submitting to. And so I think we've been raised to think and be independent, but I wonder if we've been, you know, raised to value that independence almost to a fault. Uh, But here's the question. Does submitting to someone in authority over us make us inferior to that person? It's very interesting here the words that he includes in this passage. And it really corrects our thinking. Because you say, well, the head of woman is man. Well, I don't like that. What does the next verse say? The head of Christ is God. One author said this, it is essential to understand that being under authority does not equal inferiority. Jesus was totally under the authority of God the Father, and yet what? He is totally equal to God. So you say, man, I don't want to submit to these people in authority over me. Well, Jesus submits to his father. He's totally equal with him. And so there's equality in the home, but there's different roles in the home. Okay, so again, we're not less valuable than those people that we submit to, which is, which is amazing. And again, it didn't make Christ inferior to submit, right? Not at all. Okay, let's get into kind of the, the, the body, the, 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 the meat of the passage here in verse 4. This is the part I think that is most confusing. And again, we are m- several cultures removed from this. And we can understand as best as we can, but there's, there's a bunch of stuff here that we, I don't think we're ever going to understand. And so we do the best we can with what we, what we know. Every man, he says, praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. <clears throat> but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. I am many cultures removed from this passage. Because I'm reading this and going, "This this is very misogynistic. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Doing it with a smile, otherwise the women might pick up stones and stone me going to be one of those mornings. For man is not from woman, but woman is from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. We see, we clearly see that in Genesis 1 and 2, by the way. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. What does that mean? I don't know. It's confusing. I think think next time we go through a book verse by verse, I'll just skip the uncomfortable parts. All right. So, Something, again, is happening here culturally that's very irrelevant to us today, I think, at least in our minds, because women don't wear head coverings in Western culture today. But again, there are those deeper issues of modesty and submission and respect, and I think we dismiss this passage to our own peril, so to speak, if we just say, well, I don't have to wear head coverings, so meh. I think there's more here for us as we get into this. So he says a man should not pray with his head covered. As well, he says a woman should not pray with her head uncovered. So what does it mean when it says that if the man is, is, uh, uh, if the man is covered, he dishonors his head. If the woman prays uncovered, she dishonors her head. Is it talking about their physical head? No. What did we just see in that previous passage? Here's what, here's what I think it's talking about. Who is the head of the man, according to verse 3? Jesus Christ. Who is the head of the woman, according to verse 3? The man. And so he, what he's saying here is when the man covers his head during worship, he's bringing dishonor to Christ. That's what, that's what he's saying. And the woman, by praying or prophesying with her head uncovered, she brings dishonor to her head, which is who? Her husband. Her husband. And so again, the root issue of this is about honoring those in authority over us. And and it's saying that it's possible uh, for a man or a woman to dress in such a way that we dishonor those in authority over us. And we don't tend to think of things that way, but this is what he's saying. 
And so in their culture, it was head coverings. The only women who refused to wear head coverings, as I said, or, or who shaved their heads were prostitutes or lesbians. If a guy wanted to go look for a prostitute, you would know where to go because her head wouldn't be covered. You'd know where to go find her. She was, you know, dressing in a way that was saying, I'm for sale, right? That's basically what they would do. Okay, and so let's put it this way, bringing it back to this concept, uh, th th this uh, concept. To come to church back then with your head uncovered was to come to church dressed like a prostitute. Do we see the issue now in that time, in that day and age? Is a woman dressing like that bringing honor to her husband and to her church? Yes or no? No. Has she dressed in such a way that might distract others from worshiping God? Absolutely. And I had a friend live in a Muslim country for three years, and man, he's like, it was very modest there, very different than here. Okay? I mean, imagine you're in a culture where you're, you're a married man, and the only woman's hair you ever see is your wife's. And then you see another woman having her hair out, and you think, whoa, like, you know, you're not used to seeing that, right? So let's back out from this and ask a question. Are there ways for a woman to dress immodestly today that would bring shame to her husband or to the church? Forget about the head coverings. Is there a way for ladies and men to dress immodestly in such a way that would distract others from worshiping God? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. Right? Guys can dress in certain ways that are very distracting. Guys should not be coming to church, I don't think, in a muscle shirt with their big muscles showing. Very distracting. Or in my case, my small muscles. Distracting. You don't want to see string beans here on Sunday morning, okay? I have to make you laugh, or again, you're probably going to kill me. It's a, it's a hard passage. Here's the thing. If your clothing is being... So the whole... We'll talk about this more later, but the whole thing with modesty, the problem with, with modesty is people tend to say, well, this is what modesty is, like this exact thing. The Bible doesn't tell me exactly what it is, but here's what a general view of what I would say modesty is. If your clothing is being used to frame or reveal your body in such a way so everyone sees it, it's not being modest. So ladies, your clothing should be used to shape your face, not the rest of your body. Men, your clothing should be used to shape your face, not the rest of your muscular or not muscular body. Okay? So I think that's, that, in, that in a lot of ways is what it's saying. We can bring shame onto the people we care about and even onto our church, or at least distract people by dressing in a certain way. Now, does that mean that we should legislate how we dress, like most churches used to do? Again, wearing a suit. Women can't wear pants. Are, are there any women wearing pants in here this morning? Okay? Praise God you're wearing pants. I appreciate that. Okay? What I'm saying is cultural dress changes over time. Now, it's not always for the better— Maybe it's in some ways for the worse, but we are where we are, and things aren't going back to the way they were. Okay, so just like women don't wear head coverings anymore, we don't require skirts and suits anymore. You see, why? Because the culture has changed. By the way, I think casual dress in church, uh, you know, casual dress in church is awesome, and I know some people really disagree with that, but. Um, I actually like church being a, a place where we can be comfortable and worship God together, so I have no problem with that. I do think it is a mistake to legislate morality in the church, and again, many people will take these passages on modesty and say, this specifically means that. It didn't specifically say anything, and so again, we have to be very, very careful. So again, there is a principle in this passage, modesty, dressing appropriately, right? Not dressing to bring attention to ourselves. We agree with that at least? He says here in verse, first part of verse 7, man is the image and glory of God. This is the reason why a man should not cover his head in worship. Paul says he is the image of glory and glory of God. Now, this doesn't mean that women, women aren't humans made in the image of God, but again, there is a special place of authority for the man in creation since the very beginning. But what does it mean that, that woman is the glory of man? <clears throat> woman is the glory of man. You can almost read this as a compliment right? The best part of the man is his woman. You know, behind every good man is a great woman. You know, you've, maybe you've heard things like that. And I think that's true, but we certainly see that in the creation story, right? That, that she, I mean, he meets Eve and he's just like, wow. So there's a, there's a glory there for him that when he met her. 
Um, but I think as well, there's something negative being said here because Eve did make that decision uh, to rebel against God and she did bring shame and disgrace to her husband by her rebellion. Okay? So that's what I think is potentially what's being said, said there. The, wo the woman being created for man, I think we have a little less of a problem with um, because we, we actually learned that in Genesis. When uh, Eve is created, she is called Adam's helper. Here's a question. When Eve was called Adam's helper, her, his helpmate, was that before or after they fell into sin? Before. Hmm? So her submission to her husband, her subjection to her husband, wasn't the re a result of the fall. That was actually God's original order of creation. Man was made first. He is the head. Woman was made second and was created for that specific purpose of helping helping the man, okay? Now, it says this as well in verse 10, women ought to wear the symbol of authority. He's talking about the head covering because of the angels. Maybe I should just move on. Why? What does it mean that women should cover their heads because of the angels? The commentaries don't know and neither do I. Some believe this means that right now there are good angels witnessing our worship. And they're watching to see if women are dressing modestly and if they're honoring their husbands. Some people think that. Others believe that by angels, that he, actually he means fallen angels. And that, you know, uh, and that by wearing their covering, uh, women are in some way protected from spiritual attack. I don't believe that, but I have, I have heard that. Uh, this word angels is interesting. It's actually a word that can just be translated messenger. So this might actually be talking about the pastors of the church. It may not even be speaking of spiritual beings. It might just say that maybe the pastor isn't distracted. I don't know, maybe up here. Okay. So again, this is one of those verses where we need to be very, very careful because you can take this little phrase because of the angels and you can move it over here and you can build a big doctrine off of it and say, well, it means this and it means that and this is why we should wear head coverings, but it's like it, it doesn't say any of that stuff. So we need to be careful that we don't make it say what it doesn't say, okay? We don't know why he's saying that, so we don't know. And it's so, by the way, is it okay not to know everything in Scripture perfectly? Is it okay if there's a sense of mystery in the Bible where I don't know some things, and you don't know some things? I think the Bible would be boring if we knew every single little detail perfectly and put it in a little box and put it in the closet, amen? I like that there's stuff that challenges me and sometimes even offends me, like this passage. Verse 11, nevertheless, this is the passage I think that's going to bring some relief to the ladies after what they just heard. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came through man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for saying that. I'm so glad those verses were included. Because again, that culture would have agreed with Paul of the women are unsubjected to men. They wouldn't have agreed with this part. This is going, again, above and beyond what their culture would say. To say that in the Lord, we're not independent from women, and women aren't independent from men is quite the statement. And, and Paul, again, he really evens things out when he says, you know, yes, it's true, women did originally come from man in the Garden of Eden, but where has every other man come from since then? Their mama's belly. Right? From, from a woman. So again, what does this tell us? We need each other. Men can't do it alone. By the way, women's conference is coming up. You, some of you men will have to do it alone. Amen? For my case, three kids alone for three days. So please pray for us. Hopefully we don't starve. <laughs> Just kidding. Things will be fine. How many men are, are alone with the kids for the ladies' conference this time? Anyone? Matt? Mark, are you alone? Taking the kids to the hotel or what? Oh, you have, like, grandma and helping you here and stuff. You're fine. Is she gone too? Okay. I was going to say you just drop them off at grandma's and <laughs> go hunting. <laughs> All good. <laughs> yeah. Man, I look forward to that day where our kids could be independent. We're not even close to that happening, but it's coming eventually. So, again... I like this passage because it tells me that the Bible isn't as sexist as everybody tells me it is. 
It tells me that actually God does view men and women as being equal, but, but different. Verse 13. <clears throat> this is a little confusing as well. Judge among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? We'll get to that. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. This last part, some will take that there's no such custom. They would take that to mean this thing about head coverings isn't something I'm enforcing in all of the churches. Others would say it's the exact opposite. We have no such custom in our churches that women aren't, aren't covered. So I don't actually know. But it's interesting anyways. Um, so, again, apparently in that day and age, it was not proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered. Whether that applies to us today, I think, is debatable. So let's say it does apply. Let's say head coverings do apply. How do we apply it? So here's a question. Do these passages describe exactly what a head covering is. It says head covering. Does it tell us what a head covering is? Yes or no? No, it doesn't. So we want to be perfectly biblical, literal, like literally to the point where we take everything literally. It's all for us today. There's no context. It's just all for us. There's no culture. It's all for us. And we want to enforce that. What are we asking women to wear exactly? It doesn't say. So if we say, well, you got to wear this little thing. How do we know that's what they did? Okay. As well, he says, oh, I hear someone calling for daddy. I have to go. My daddy's sense is kicking in. Verse 14, long hair dishonors men. Just, just because I'm sure you're all wondering, does verse 14 forbid men from having long hair? Didn't Jesus have long hair in the films? Probably not in real life. Here's a question for you, or, or here's a comment. Clearly, long hair in and of itself isn't wrong because there's something in the Bible called what? A Nazarite vow. What is a Nazarite vow? What did Samson do? And John the Baptist do? And Paul the Apostle, who wrote this, took on a Nazarite vow at one point. What is a Nazarite vow? Men grow their hair out. Which tells you, so if taking the vow meant you grew your hair out, that tells you probably long hair for men was not that typical, right? If it's otherwise, why would it be a special thing that men did, right? Okay, let's, let's again bring this to practical terms. So we say long hair is wrong, men shouldn't have long hair. Okay, let's apply it to our church. Let's say we forbid long men, uh, long men, long hair for men in the church. We don't forbid long men. There are some very tall men here in this church, okay? We do not forbid long men, long hair. So let's just say, because the Bible says so, we forbid long hair. Here's the question. What is considered long? Does the Bible tell me how long is long? Yes or no? No. Does the Bible tell me how much hair is too much hair for a man? No. So again, this becomes very hard to legislate in the church, and many churches have done this. This is too long. This is too long. Now, if a guy has hair all the way down to his feet, maybe we've got to pull the guy aside and talk to him. I don't know. That's maybe too long. I think the issue with the long hair, by the way, had more to do with men looking feminine than it is length, which God talks all about in Scripture, right? Looking feminine is not a good thing for men to do. But again, you say, we're going we're gonna to enforce this in the church. Men can't have long hair. Okay, but it doesn't tell me what the forbidden length of hair is. So again, how can we enforce it? I don't think we can. So again, I think this shame he's talking about here, this thing that is against nature, he says, which is very similar language that he uses in Romans 1 regarding homosexuality. It's interesting that he does that. I mean, you turn on your TV, one of those cross-dressers pops up or a transgender person, and you're like, do you feel comfortable looking at that? I don't. And so I think there is something shameful about men dressing like women and women, women looking like men. I think that's maybe what he's saying here. 
So if a man decides to have longer hair here, how in the world do you police that? You can't. I heard a great quote, by the way, about this long hair. I loved it. It was so good. Uh, so good that I'm going to read it to you. You can tell I had holidays. Hey, I got some more energy up here. Wait till next week. I'll be back down to the low energy guy. Quote, <clears throat> pastors should worry less about the length of people's hair and worry more about the length of, the, uh, the length of their sermons. Okay? And I'm right about to 12 o'clock here, so i got to hurry. We got lunch at Chicken Chef, Pastor. You better hurry. Too bad for you. We're not quite done yet. So again, I've got bigger fish to fry than policing your hair and your clothing. Amen? we got to reach people for Jesus this summer at VBS in camp. Amen? We don't need to worry about this stuff, I don't think, compared to what matters. I don't think someone's going to stand before God someday and God's going to look at, at him and say, you know, talking to a guy, if your hair was this much shorter, we would have let you into heaven, but it was this much too long and you sinned and you didn't confess that sin, so down you go. I don't think at all that's what's happening, okay? A woman's hair is a glory to her. You want me to throw another wrench into this whole debate and confuse you even more? Verse 15. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory for her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Could the head covering be the woman's hair and not a piece of material? Could this passage really be talking about women appearing too masculine and men appearing too feminine? Maybe. So some believe that verse 15 is teaching that actually the covering women should have in church is their long hair, not a piece of cloth. And I don't know, but it's interesting. Very interesting. Now, you're thinking, well, Kevin, that was very interesting. Thank you for wasting our time. None of this applies to us today. Fantastic. Interesting information. Not so fast. Well, head coverings... I don't think they do apply today. There is, again, a root issue behind these things. And I think the, the root issue they had, we have much worse. So let's get into, so again, you read scripture. What does it say? What does it mean? How does it apply to us? I've been saying that since Ephesians three years ago. This July, I've been here three years. We talked about what it says. We talked about what it means in the context. What is the universal principle now for us? Here's, here's three that I think matter for us. Number one. God still wants us to honor and submit to authority. Is that still true? I think it's still true. The Bible teaches that man is the head of the home and the church. I still think that applies today. I think women are still called to submit to those authorities. I don't think that's changed. Men are still called to love and to lead and to submit to Christ as they do that. And what we see in our culture and even in the church today is the utter failure of most men to lead their homes and churches. Men, do, men make two mistakes. Either they overexert their authority and hurt their families by abuse, verbal or, verbal or physical or otherwise, um, or just being too burdensome. Or, on the other extreme, they are passive cowards who refuse to step up and lead. And that's true in our culture, and it's true in our church. We also see an absolute hatred of authority in our culture and even in the church. So whether it be parents, your boss, the police, the government, your husband, the church— we are, at best, suspicious of those in authority, and at worst, totally against submitting to them. Okay, so there, there's a lot of women today, they're like, I'm not submitting to my husband. There are a lot of us in this room who are like, I'm not submitting to this government. Sorry, but it's true. Okay, some of you have a boss, you're like, I don't really like submitting to this guy. I, I know more than him. Why is he the boss? I should be the boss. So this is something in our hearts that's in our culture that's really hard for us to deal with, but it's true. But what we see in our culture is what happens when no one is in charge. It's anarchy and chaos. There's nobody in charge because nobody wants to submit to anybody. One author said this, our failure to exercise biblical authority and our failure to submit to biblical authority isn't just wrong and sad, it sins against the very nature of God. If Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father are in the Trinity and there's submission within the Trinity, you can pay your taxes. Really, it's going to be okay. You can submit to your husband. You can submit to your boss. You can submit to your teachers in school. Again, if Jesus can do that, we can do that too. 
Number two, I think God still wants us to be modest. I think the Bible teaches us to dress modestly. I don't think our culture is modest at all. If you go walk around a high school in summer, it's unbelievable. It's gross, actually, if you're, especially if you're a guy. You're like, man, this is gross. And as much as we want to look down on this passage about head coverings as old and outdated and archaic, is how we dress in 2024 any better? I bet some of you guys would prefer this culture walking down the street in the summer, amen? Really? You know, I mean, man, my buddy who lived in Afghanistan three years, he said, man, Kevin, he's like, lust is always a challenge for men, but he's like, it was a lot easier living in Afghanistan. I said, well, why? He's like, women are covered up. And many of them can't leave their homes, including his wife, who could leave the home for almost three years. Not saying we do that. Man, that's, that's a lot easier than what we see in our culture. And by the way, ladies, I think you see how some women dressed, and you're ashamed for them too. Maybe I'm right about that. Now, modesty might look different for us uh, than for these people in the Bible in some small ways, but the principle, again, is still the same. We dress to frame our face and not our body, and we dress in such a way uh, as to not make our brother or sister stumble. And I think that's still true today. Finally, and I'm right at 12 o'clock. Look at that. God still wants us to have proper worship. One thing that becomes clear to me studying 1 Corinthians is just how chaotic this church's worship time was whether they were getting drunk at communion, which we're talking about next week. How much of the communion did you have to drink to get drunk, by the way? (laughs) Those those little cups? It was a little different back then, I think, but anyways. So whether it was that, or it was the whole room speaking in tongues all at once, or women dressing in certain ways that offended people, or the divisions they had, this was not a church that was gathering together and worshiping God with reverence and fear. And I think that really is maybe the bottom line of this section. Do these Corinthians fear God? Do they care what he thinks? Does he care about my attitude towards those in authority over me? Does he care about how much of my body I reveal? How much do I save for my spouse versus, versus how much do I promote to the world? Does he care about how we worship? I think he does. Certainly he does. And so again, I think the Corinthians should not be a church we look down on. I think they need to be a church that is a very powerful reminder to us that God is present here, God is present in our lives, and that what we say and do matters. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, looking at the good and looking at the evil. And he's doing that here. He's doing that in your home. He knows exactly how you are leading your home, men. He knows exactly how you are are respecting and honoring your husband, ladies. And I think that stuff matters. And I think this section on head coverings, while weird, and thank you for not throwing tomatoes at me, I suppose, it's still important for us to consider what submission and honor and modesty means for us today. Fair enough? Fair enough? Let's pray. One amen is good enough for me. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your care for us. And again, we look at this passage, God, it's so far removed. We don't understand. And yet, in an Eastern culture, they would perfectly understand this. I think maybe our culture is so different and so far gone in some ways that this just sounds off to us. Maybe we're the ones that are off, and the rest of the world is right. But thank you, God, that there are still universal principles here about submitting to you and submitting to those in authority over us and honoring those uh, as we honor you, and and even modesty, which is something not talked about much today. And so, God, we're we're just excited to be in your word, and, and we love learning from you and and we just love that the Bible is, is um, on one hand, easy to learn, but on the other hand, you know, impossible to master. And we thank you that we're always learning, we're always growing, and that you love us and that you're taking care of us each day. And so thank you, God, for this, this message, and thank you for our, our worship time tonight. I pray everyone comes, and, and we really, beyond watching our kids play piano, that we would really come here with hearts ready and excited to worship you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.